Hi, Mick McQuaid here, uh, welcoming you to the second video of day five, the uh, first day of week two. And uh, in this short video, I'd like to talk a little bit about multiple linear regression and some of the subtopics thereof, which include estimating multiple linear regression coefficients and some uh, answering four uh, questions about multiple linear regression. So let's begin by taking a look at a picture of multiple linear regression. Multiple linear regression is just like simple linear regression, except there's more of it. No, actually, seriously, the multiple linear regression is just like simple linear regression, except that there are more predictors. And uh, since there are more predictors, in, if there are, uh, for example, two predictors, as there are in this picture, instead of finding a least squares line, we're going to find a least squares plane. That's what's being depicted here. So we have on the x and y axis we have two predictors and on the, the z axis we have y. And so given some value of x1 and some value, let's suppose we're doing this, given some value of x1 and some value of x2, this is the, the excuse me, the other end of this line here is the value of x that we predict, um, value of y that we predict. Boy, I'm really getting tongue twisted here. Um, and and these uh, lines emanating from the least squares plane are the sum of their their squares is RSS for this model. And so what we seek to do is to minimize RSS for this model. So it's very much like the simple linear regression model, uh, except that there are um, you know we're using more predictors. And so you might ask, well, why bother? Well, we already learned simple linear regression. Why don't we just stick with that? Simple linear regression worked for us yesterday, and uh, it probably will still work for us today, and we already know it. So let's forget about multiple linear regression. Ha, I say. It turns out that uh, we cannot forget about multiple linear regression, and we'll use an example from yesterday to explain why. Let's take a look at the... Uh, uh, t TV and um, TV advertising and sales example. Well, we also have information about sales uh, related to radio and newspaper advertising as well as TV advertising. So one thing that you might want to do is do simple linear regressions on all three of them and find out that all three are valuable. All three are, are adding something. And if you recall from our, our discussion yesterday, we have a coefficient. We divide that coefficient by the standard error, we get a t-statistic. If this t-statistic is large, it tells us that the probability, well, this p-value tells us that the probability of observing this t-statistic, a t-statistic that's this large or larger, if, um, the co if this coefficient is equal to zero, is this probability. So it's very small. So, so probably this coefficient is not zero. This coefficient is not zero. These coefficients are not lying to us. These are real. These are probably real coefficients here. That's what that's what this small p value and these large t statistics are telling us. So it looks like both radio and newspaper are uh, making a contribution. By the way, intercept here refers to beta naught. So this is beta naught in this row and beta one in this row. So the hypothesis that is being tested by this um, T statistic <clears throat> is that um, in this case, beta one is equal to zero. What, what does this coefficient mean? Let's remind ourselves what this coefficient means. It means that for every unit of um, radio advertising, we expect sales to increase by 0.2 units. So if these are dollars, then I guess every dollar of radio, I don't remember what the the, the, oh, they're in, I see, they're in thousands of dollars. So for every thousand dollars of radio advertising, we expect an additional $200 uh, dollars in sales. I think that's what this is telling me. And for every a thousand dollars worth of, uh, of uh, well, oh, sales of 55 units, not dollars. So this is, so each, um, so these are in, <laughs> the sales variable is in thousands of units. So, so 55 units more will be sold for every thousand dollars of newspaper advertising. 203 more units will be sold for every uh, additional thousand dollars of radio advertising. That's what this is telling us. So, um, are we done? Not by a long shot. Let's try a multiple regression 
of TV, radio, and newspaper all at once. Want to? Well, of course, the, the, you've got to expect the authors of this textbook chose this data set because it was going to make a point. This is a real data set, by the way. This isn't a simulated data set. So this is a real data set. And oops, what do we find here? There's something very uh, wrong with this table, something very much at odds with the table, the tables that we looked at above. And what is wrong with this table is this enormous p-value here. This enormous p-value here tells us that this number is lying to us. This is probably really zero. The, the chances of observing this number, I mean, excuse me, the chances of observing this t-statistic or a larger one, if this were zero, are 85%. The chances of observing this, if this were really zero, are 85%. So that doesn't give me much confidence in this number. In fact, this tells me that newspaper isn't contributing to sales in this case. Newspaper advertising isn't contributing to sales. How can that be? Our individual regressions told us that newspaper was contributing to sales. What could possibly be wrong? The book gives a hilarious example of um, the phenomenon that's at work here. And the example that is given is of shark attacks on a beach. So imagine that we're trying to predict shark attacks on a beach, and we find that um, temperature seems to, to work. You know, if, if the temperature is high, then there are more shark attacks on the beach. Then we try ice cream sales. Ice cream sales seem to work too. If ice cream sales are high, there are more shark attacks at the beach. What is wrong with this picture? Are you going to ban ice cream sales because there are more shark attacks? Are you going to ban ice cream sales to decrease the, the shark attacks? No. Obviously, what's happening is that either um, ice cream sales increase when the temperature is high, and the, the, the high temperature is the cause, or there's some other cause, and, and um, high temperature is simply related to that, and um, ice cream sales are related to high temperature. So what's happened here, and let's just take a look at the correlation matrix. What's happened here is that there is a correlation between radio and newspaper. And this is causing us to, to spurious, get a spurious sense of the importance of newspaper when we do an individual regression. So how can we possibly um, cope with that? I mean, what, who's to say that they're not all spurious? Who's to say that all the individual regressions are, are not a problem? Or that all when we do the multiple regression, who's to say that uh, there isn't a, a problem uh, with all of them? So this gets into some of the questions that we need to answer about multiple linear regression. So let's take a look at, at those questions, and then we'll, we'll answer them. Where are they? Here we go. So is at least one predictor useful? So we would like to make sure that at least one of these predictors makes is, is making a difference. Do all the predictors help, or is it, there some subset that helps? And how well does this model fit the data? And then finally, given a set of predictor values, what response value should we predict, and how accurate can we expect our prediction to be? So let's look at this first question. Is at least one of the predictors useful? Well, yeah, the t-statistics were good. Well, there's a bit of a problem with the t-statistics. Suppose we had, instead of three predictors, we had 100 predictors. If we had 100 predictors, this p-value uh, is usually, usually the cutoff that we choose for this is going to be either 1% or 5%. So um, if we have 100 uh, predictors, we could get into a situation where 1% of the predictors shows a high p-value, just a high enough p-value just by chance. You know, we, there's a 1% chance that one of those will be, uh, that the, one of the p-values will be big enough. Um, a 5% chance, and, and there's still some chance that one of these p-values is large, even though, um, even when we have a few predictors. But if we have a lot of predictors, the chances of getting a spurious p-value are higher. I hate the fact that it's called p-values because we're using the word p, or we're using the letter p to denote dimensions, and dimensions is the issue here. The number of variables is the issue here, the number of predictors. And so we have 
the F statistic to the rescue. So the F statistic will help us. The F statistic is our friend in this situation. Is at least one of the predictors useful? We would like something that's like the T statistic, but takes into account the, the number of predictors so that it can't be fooled. If we have a large number of predictors, we eventually run into this situation where there's a chance that one of them is going to appear to be significant. We want a statistic that's hard to fool that way. And, and the F statistic has P, and I don't mean P value. This is the P, our, our dimension, the number of predictors embedded in it. And so as the number of predictors grows, the F statistic shrinks because it's in, the, it's in the denominator of the denominator and the denominator of the numerator. So consequently, the, um, well, it's this one that makes it shrink. Um, so consequently, the, the F statistic is a, is a uh, better way to figure out if we have at least one good predictor. If the F statistic is small, um, we don't have any good predictors. And we, we can stop right there. We need to move on to some other predictors. Um, if the F statistic is large, then we can continue. We know that something good is going on. And then we move on to the next question. What was the next question? It was, oh yeah, is there a subset that's good? Let's, let me find that next question here. Here's, oh, and here, here's another. So you should read all this stuff, all the details on the F statistic. This is F statistic for a subset um, because we, we may end up in a situation where we have uh, two subsets of, of, we have the, the overall RSS and then the RSS of part of the data. We want to know a partial F. So definitely read all of this stuff. But in any event, um, what are the important variables? If, if the F statistic test has been passed, then what are the important variables? And to decide on uh, important variables, what we care about really is the RSS. So the short answer for, for uh, figuring out what are the important variables are figuring out which variables uh, contribute the most to reducing the RSS. Remember RSS stands for the residual sum of squares and that is the measure of unexplained variation and we would like to reduce that to be as small as possible. We, there's some irreducible error so we can never um, be sure of reducing it to zero. But, uh, but we want to reduce it as much as we can. And whichever variables help us to reduce it the most, those are the variables that we want. So one thing that we can do is just add one variable at a time. Oh, and there are, all, there are various other statistics that we're going to learn about later that we can use. But in general, um, what we're going to do is add one variable at a time. Um, and we're going to add the one that gives us the lowest uh, RSS for the increased the, for the model with the increased number of, of uh, variables and we could keep doing that until we have added all the variables or until we've met some criteria because eventually the RSS isn't going to be um, reduced anymore so we might have a stopping value of, of RSS another thing we could do is the exact reverse of this we could go exactly backwards we could put in all the variables and then take out um, the variables, take out the, the whatever variable has the largest p-value and just keep doing that until we get down to some stopping value or until we have nothing left. Doesn't always work. Or better still, we can do some kind of a mixed version of this. And this is much more likely. This is much more likely to be what we're going to do. One reason is we can't use backward selection if p is larger than n, although if p is larger than n, we have other problems. There, there are some serious issues if p is that, that big. We're not likely to be using linear regression anyway. But even if p, if p is large, uh, backward selection might not be a good idea. You have to use some intuition about what's, what's good. You have to have some knowledge of the domain to do anything with these kinds of learning approaches. And so it's probably a good idea to, to go forward and back, to start with forward and then go back. And the problem, the reason why you want to go back is this little statement right here. Forward selection is a greedy approach. So that means that it can be trapped by local, uh, local maxima or local minima. And so uh, it, it will um, potentially take us down a blind alley. And so we might want to go back. Uh, and so 
mix selection is, is a way of doing that. Mix selection is a way of going back. Okay, and then, uh, of course, the um, third question is, how well does the model fit? And we've already talked about R squared, but there is a terrible problem with R squared, which is that R squared can be artificially driven up by adding more variables. So R squared isn't ideal. So we want some statistic, and there is a, a statistic we'll explore later um, for doing that, an R squared, uh, adjusted R squared that is not um, as susceptible to uh, uh, the inflation of adding a lot, a lot of variables. But um, RSE also has P in the denominator. So RSE is uh, a good, um, is, is a useful way of figuring out whether uh, we have a good model fit or whether potentially we have a problem because of, of too many, um, too many uh, predictor variables, a problem that R squared can't catch. So we want to look at both RSE and R squared. Now, the textbook tells us that graphical summaries can reveal problems, and graphical summaries can if P is small. Um, graphical summaries become difficult the larger that P is. But we do see an example with the TV and radio stuff. This is a, a really excellent um, case for using uh, graphical means. Unfortunately, this is just a, a plain uh, plot. What would be nice is if we could rotate this plot around, because if we could rotate this plot around, you would see that the, the shape of this is not flat. It is a hump. So we're, we're tending to underestimate um, sales whenever radio and TV, it's like a saddle, actually, I guess you could say. It's like a uh, picture of a saddle. So we tend to underestimate sales when the budget is evenly mixed between TV and radio. But if the budget is very lopsided toward radio or the budget is very lopsided toward TV, we have a tendency to overestimate sales. So there is some kind of synergy between TV and radio. Apparently, they work better together than either do separately, which is a fairly intuitive result. That's the sort of thing that we might um, expect if we know anything about advertising, that uh, having being exposed to, to advertisements in multiple mediums, multiple media, excuse me, um, increase the increase uh, salience and um, <clears throat> so, so that's a, a, an intuitive result, and it's something that, that um, it, it's a limitation of, of linear regression that, that we um, seemingly can't model this saddle picture. Actually, we can, and in fact, in a, later, in a later section of this chapter, we'll talk about a technique for figuring out uh, if there is some kind of synergy between a couple of variables or some kind of interaction going on between uh, two variables. We can actually add that to a linear, a multiple linear regression model, but we can't add it to a model that just has, um, you know, beta naught plus beta one x one plus beta two x two. We have to do, we have to take some special steps to to do that. Okay, and that pretty much. Oh, predictions. I forgot. The fourth question is predictions, and this is quite significant, and I think it's a little bit hard to understand. There's a bit of a subtle issue here. So we already talked about 95% confidence intervals and 95% confidence intervals are mentioned here and here's a 95% confidence interval for the um, uh, advertising for the uh, what is this for, for a combination of 100,000 spent on TV and 20,000 spent on uh, radio here's a 95% confidence interval for unit sales or thousands of unit sales. So um, this confidence interval takes into account the averages. Um, the, what the confidence interval tells us is that the true mean for sales lies in this interval. And if we want to make a prediction, we have to face the fact that the prediction isn't necessarily going to come out to be the mean. The prediction is actually potentially uh, an outlier. So a prediction interval is inherently wider. So here's a prediction interval, a 95% prediction interval. This is inherently wider than the 95% confidence interval because it, it 
takes into account that um, the, uh, the prediction may not be right at the mean. So you can see that the, um, on the low end, it's 2,000 units or whatever, two, yeah, two or 3,000 units uh, less than the, the confidence interval. And at the high end, it's 3,000 units more than the, the uh, confidence interval. Because if we want to um, predict, that's predict a, a particular value of, of y given two values of, uh, uh, given a value of x1 and a value of x2. Uh, if we want to predict a value of y, um, that's different from saying what we think is the mean of y. It's less, we're, we're less certain about the exact value of y than we are about what the mean of y. And in fact, we're, when we predict the mean, we're taking advantage of the fact that a bunch of individual uh, elements will be scattered around the mean. Okay, I hope that's reasonably clear. That's all the time I have, and I want to move on to our next topic now. So uh, be careful to read this material, and, uh, and we can talk about it more offline. Thanks for your attention.